Roundtable Osteuropa. Ein Podcast des Zentrums für Osteuropa und internationale Studien. Vitaite and welcome to another episode of the Roundtable Osteuropa Podcast. As Poland prepares for its upcoming parliamentary elections, the political landscape is buzzing with questions, predictions and analyses. And the country seems to be more divided than ever. But today we're taking a deeper dive into the context of the upcoming elections, a dive into a very specific and crucial segment of the population, Poland's youth. What do young Poles think and feel about politics, especially in these turbulent times of war? What do they make of the political parties that are running and how do these political debates play out on the family level? To shed some light on these questions, we've recently undertaken a survey and we will share some of the findings with you today. To unpack and discuss the findings, I'm thrilled to have with me two of my dear colleagues, Hakob Matevosian and Felix Kravacek. Both are researchers here at the Center for East European and International Studies, ZEUS, in Berlin. Both have devoted their careers to understanding political behavior and societal trends. Hakob is a postdoctoral researcher for the Move Me Rule Research Project. This project is funded by the European Research Council and explores the transmission of historical memories across generations, with a special focus on Russian-speaking groups. For this project, Hakob leads the work package on conducting surveys. With me in the studio is also Felix Kravacek. Felix spearheads the research cluster on youth and generational change here at Zeus. He is also the principal investigator of the Move Me Roo project. Welcome, Felix. Welcome, Jakob. Thanks, Johanna. It's nice to be back. Yeah, glad to be here. I'm happy to be your host today. I'm Johanna Mokwitz, and I work as the academic coordinator of the Move Me Roo project. If you would like to find out more about this uh, project, I can recommend listening to the podcast episode, which we published back in March. But today we just want to speak about Poland. So whether you're curious about the upcoming elections or whether you just want to understand the pulse of the Polish youth, this podcast episode is for you. So stay tuned, grab your kava or herbata and let's dive in. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to have Haka break down for our listeners what exactly is at stake in these elections. Haka, can you tell us a bit why we all should be watching the news closely on October 15th? Well, thank you, Johanna. Before I'm going uh, to say what is at stake in these elections, let me say a few words about the election itself. These elections will set the stage for the next four years and decide who will lead the same and Senate. Perhaps this will be the most significant election since 1989. At the heart of this electoral showdown are two main political parties. On the one hand, Law and Justice, Peace, and Civic Platform, PO. Peace has been in the power for two terms and has made headlines with some controversial and far-reaching social reforms like the abortion law, which significantly limited women's reproductive rights, sparkling nationwide protests. PIS is known for its conservative and nationalist ideology, and they are aiming for a historic third term. So this is one side. On the other side, we have Civic Platform, PO, a center-right and pro-European party. They have a different vision for Poland, a more liberal and internationalist approach. Their platform focuses on strengthening Poland's ties with the European Union and advocating for democratic values. Obviously, these two political parties represent two different paths for Poland, and the outcome of these elections will be a critical barometer of where the country is headed. So now, uh, let me go to what is at stake and distinguish three major points. First one, a crucial question revolves around Poland's alignment with Western liberal values. The election will determine whether Poland continues to adhere to the principles of liberal democracy, human rights and individual freedoms championed by many Western countries. A shift away from these values could have far-reaching consequences for Poland's relationship with its European Union partners and the broader international community. Number two, Poland's role within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is another key consideration. The elections will influence whether Poland maintains its commitment to NATO's collective defense and security framework. And this decision is particularly significant given the geopolitical tension in Eastern Europe and Russia's assertive behavior, including its war with Ukraine. 
Poland's stance with NATO could impact regional stability and security. And the last point that I would like to make is about the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, which has a profound implications for Poland's foreign policy. The election's outcome will determine whether Poland continues to support Ukraine in its struggle against Russia and how it engages with Russia diplomatically. A shift in Poland's stance could impact not only its relationship with Ukraine, but also its broader role in regional geopolitics. Johan, I believe these are the key questions and points which underscore the fundamental choices facing Polish voters. Thanks, Jakob. That uh, already helped a lot to, to set the stage. There's another point. So there's been a lot of chatter about some referendum that seems to be slipping in under the radar. Felix, can you shed some light on the significance of this referendum and the implications that it might have? Indeed, it's a topic that gets a little bit lost um, when we look at the media coverage because alongside casting their ballot for the new parliament um, on the 15th of October, polls will be asked to respond to four questions that PiS has introduced in mid-August. They announced um, these four referendum questions, which I think show us that the electoral campaign hasn't really been going so well until then. Already in the run-up to the summer, peace tried to mobilize its voters. There was this reform or this introduction of a new state commission to investigate whether economic and political decisions taken in the past um, undermined Poland's national security. And there was this promise to extend the social welfare program. But this all failed to really kind of get the media um, excited about the election and crucially to mobilize voters who had indicated that they might abstain from voting. So mid-August then, uh, we've seen this attempt by peace to regain control of the campaign and to hopefully, from their perspective, appeal to a wider electoral base. Introducing a referendum alongside an election is something we've seen recently also in other EU countries. Hungary did the same in 2021 um, with a very controversial referendum on so-called child protection measures. But so what's happening now in Poland? Um, really, the referendum is about the question number four, which reads as follows. Do you support the admission of thousands of illegal migrants from the Middle East and Africa in accordance with a forced relocation mechanism imposed by the European bureaucracy? So we can see here, well, the anti-migratory, anti-European anti stance that peace has brought into um, the political landscape of Poland. But I said already there are four referendum questions. I think the crucial one is number four. But if the referendum were only to be about that fourth question, I think there were concerns within peace that it would actually help the far-right confederation more than it would help peace. And therefore, we see three other referendum questions that are part of this overall package. These are all related to social and economic questions and one about the removal of the fence with the border to Belarus. What is a bit surprising about these referendum questions is there is actually no political party in Poland that advocates for any of the things that the voters are asked to oppose in these referendum questions. So there's no political party that says we should remove the barrier of the border between Poland and Belarus. So I think the point here is not so much about the decision itself, but it's a sign that peace wants to send to its electorate that it has at its core of the interests of the defense, the defense of Poland, the defense of national sovereignty and, and security. And at the same time, implicitly, it's a way to kind of point the finger to the previous PO government um, and some of the mistakes in the peace language that they've been doing um, since PO raised the retirement age to 67 and now in the referendum. Voters are asked to oppose the increase of a retirement age um, and peace also accepted in 2015 the compulsory EU migration relocation quotas. Um, so I think, yep, the key point, question number four, illegal migrants from the Middle East and Africa and recentering the electoral campaign on the topic of national sovereignty and security. Okay, so, so we have this referendum, which is uh, rather controversial, I would say. But then, of course, we also have other discussions in the run-up to the elections. What are some of the key lines that we can see there in these discussions? I think two points that are particularly striking when we look at the political discourse at the moment is the omnipresence of Germany and the shifting language about Ukraine. And both themes, they circulate around this idea of defending national sovereignty. First, on Germany... That is kind of an old hat. Uh, we've always seen Germany being very visible in Polish public discourse and Polish political discourse. Um, but now in the run-up to the election, I have the impression this has taken on a new um, kind of new intensity. 
So already the referendum, when it was announced in mid-August, was justified by Kaczynski by the need for Poles to decide what is happening in their country rather than, and I quote, some German politicians. That omnipresence of Germany is particularly visible also through the personalization of Polish politics. So the entire electoral campaign in the public seems to revolve around a battle between Tusk, the leader of um, Civic Platform, and Kaczynski, the leader of Law and Justice. And Tusk himself is constantly being accused of being pro-German, of having conducted a Russia-friendly policy with Merkel. And in social media, we see plenty of clips where Polish politics during Tusk's times are simply dismissed as being directed from Berlin. That Germany that we encounter in the Polish media is one um, that is accused of being a simple continuation of the criminal German regime of World War II, so we see kind of this blending of present-day political conflicts and the historical foe um, of Nazi Germany. In addition, there's this topic of the reparations, um, which has been going on for roughly 20 years now. So it, again, it is, it is an old hat. But in the context of the upcoming elections, it has gained in significance and it's also gained in legitimacy from a Polish perspective due to the war in Ukraine. Because what we can observe in the Polish discourse is that demands for reparations for the damage done by Nazi Germany to Poland during World War II are linked with demands for Russia to pay reparations to Ukraine after the war. And so the way it works in the Polish discourse is that the claim is that if Germany paid reparations today, it would send an important signal for other aggressor countries, meaning Russia. And then in addition to the topic of Germany, there's a lot of language about Ukraine now, which is very different in stark contrast to the very supportive language about Ukraine and the political support, such as weapon deliveries and humanitarian aid that we've seen immediately after February 2022. This shift has been happening over the last couple of weeks, but really the kind of symbol when things started to go from bad to worse was um, Ukrainian President Zelensky's speech at the UN General Assembly on the 19th of September. In that speech, Zelensky claimed that some in Europe were playing out solidarity in a political theater by turning grain supplies into a political thriller, and they were thereby helping to set the stage for a Moscow actor. So here we've got a couple of topics that are coming together, the most important one being this grain deal and Zelensky's complaints in particular to Poland of not being sufficiently supportive and therefore helping Moscow. Of course, that set in motion quite some waves of um, frustration and very stern reactions on the Polish side. On the grain deal, one should mention that this is actually a really important topic in Poland. 40% of the population live in rural areas, so the grain deal and the rural voters, they really matter in the run-up to the election. And therefore, the Polish continuation of the import restrictions on wheat from Ukraine, you know, they appeal to the local domestic and political environment. The discourse then escalated further after Zelensky's speech. Mateusz Morawiecki, the prime minister, said that Poland will no longer deliver weapons, um, which kind of he then stepped back a little bit from that claim and made it clear that Poland will, of course, comply to the obligations and to the promises it has made. But we can see that the discourse on Ukraine has shifted. Um, Duda um, made a very provocative statement uh, claiming that Ukraine is behaving like a drowning person, clinging to everything they can then continuing saying that a drowning person is extremely dangerous because that person can pull you down to the depth. Um, and therefore, then Duda concluded, we must, we as Poland, must act to protect ourselves from the harm that might be done by a drowning person. So we see, and I think that will continue um, in the weeks to the elections now, the issue of how to position Poland vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is, is starting to gain a new dynamic to become more controversial. We also see claims or requests now that Ukrainian children should be going to Polish school, which has been, the kind of Polish educational system was very hands-off so far, but now there's a push to change the domestic political stance on school-age Ukrainians. Um, so with the election context, I think these two topics, language about Germany and language about Ukraine, yeah, have gained a new intensity and, and that is certainly to continue over the next week. Yeah, 
thanks Felix and Jakob for, for giving us this overview of the different aspects of what is really currently at stake and going on in Poland. Now, if we turn a bit away from the more general and go to your very own research, can you tell us a bit about what prompted you to conduct this particular survey that you conducted um, among the Polish youth? Yeah, so this year's survey is the continuation of a project that we started last year um, in 2022 with Piotr Goldstein, who is also a researcher here. And initially we were interested in understanding the sense of national identity that young Poles express in a context where a lot of things are changing in their country. So we've seen the pandemic of COVID-19, the very controversial way of managing it, the restriction on the abortion laws, but also a number of other social programs that peace um, introduced in Poland. And we were interested in early 2022 to understand what do young Poles make out of that. Um, and then the launch of the survey coincided with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, and therefore, we adjusted some of the questions to respond to well that new, that new situation. Um, and in particular, the inflow of Ukrainian refugees to Poland after February 2022. So this was the start. Um, we're interested in understanding the welcoming attitudes that young Poles expressed vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian refugees, which was in stark contrast to this, their support of the pushbacks of the mostly Muslim refugees at the border with Belarus. And now this year's survey really is a continuation of the work we've done in the past. We've extended it to focus on a few more topics um, that are of present day relevance, but that's the context for this research project. Okay. And then, Jakob, so this year's survey, you got involved with that. So what is the aim of the survey that you're doing this year and what has changed or not in comparison to the previous round? So what you did last year? <coughs> well, Johanna, the aim of our survey in April, May uh, 2023 was to provide an understanding of attitudes of young Poles aged 16 to 34 in relation to a wide range of societal and political issues. And we polled more than 2,000 young Poles. While we wanted to maintain some continuity with previous surveys, what Felix just described, we also thought to introduce new components that would enrich our analysis and provide fresh insights into the evolving landscape. One of the elements we retained for comparative purpose was the section on responses to the war in Ukraine. This allowed us to track changes and trends over time in how young individuals perceive and react to international conflict. In addition to this, we introduced several new sections. Notably, we included a segment on political identification and attitudes. And this was a key addition as it helped us to delve deeper into the political beliefs and affiliations of young respondents, shedding light on their political orientations and values. Furthermore, we explored family traditions and attitudes, recognizing the importance of intergenerational dynamics in shaping the values and perspectives of young people. This component will also be studied in the Move Me Rue surveys, allowing us to draw connections between family influences and broader societal trends. Overall, the new survey encompassed a wide array of modules from basic sociodemographic information to international outlook, aiming to provide a holistic view of the views and experiences of young respondents in the context of contemporary social and political issues. Let me provide one actually intertwined question that we included in the survey. It sounded, to what extent do you agree or disagree that the Poles today are responsible for the historical crimes committed by their ancestors? And we offered a five-point scale of responses, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. As a follow-up, we inquired whether respondents had ever engaged in discussions with their parents regarding historical crimes that some believe were committed by Poles in the past. And we also asked if they shared an agreement or disagreement with their parents' viewpoints on this matter. Well, these are some quite tough questions, I would say. Um, so I'm interested to hear what, what the results were. So lots of questions that you asked, but if maybe each of you could just share the two for you most interesting findings from the survey. I don't know if Felix Hakapu wants to start. Sure, I can I can go first. Um, I would return to the context of the elections. Um, so we also asked about voting intentions of the young respondents that we surveyed. There are a few things that are remarkable here because they also illustrate um, the current political dynamic. So the first one is a very high rate of people who want to participate in the elections. It's three quarters of the young population that indicate that they would like to participate in the election. That's slightly above um, the rates that we've seen in the past. And it's known, of course, that young people are 
having historically always a lower turnout, but nevertheless, this year might be different. Um, and the three quarters of respondents who want to participate, I think that's quite an important number. And we'll see on 15th of October what actually will have happened. In addition to wanting to vote, people also have very interesting or very kind of telling party preferences that I would like to say a few words about. So the first one is that the highest support in terms of political parties among the young age group that we have surveyed is for confederation. So that's the far right party advocating for a very kind of that's a nationalist policy um, turn away from the Ukrainian politics that we've seen over the last one and a half years and a clear emphasis on Poland first. Among the young electorate, we see that they're polling at 20%, according to our data, that compares to 10% within the national population. So twice as many of the young people compared to the overall population would want to vote for Confederation. On the other hand, we see much lower support for the two main parties among youth. So that's Civic Platform, PO, and Law and Justice, Peace. Whereas in the general population, Peace has somewhere around 35% among the young people that we have been asking, uh, we see just above 11% who would want to vote for peace. So a third, roughly, compared to the general population. And civic platform, same, much lower than the general population, not as drastic as with peace. So civic platform, the main opposition party to peace, scores at 30% in the general population, whereas among the youth, it stands at roughly 18%. What is important as well is that we've got around 28% of the young people who in April, May still indicated that they were undecided. So that's an important group to watch. Who will able to mobilize them? Who will be able to grasp those votes? I think can be quite decisive uh, in the overall result that we see. What is certain, though, is that the two main parties who have been in power over the last two decades, namely PO and Peace, they've got very little support and we've got Again, three quarters of the young people who say that Poland is heading in the wrong direction. So we see a lot of frustration among that age group. And the last point I think that is interesting is a gender split in the support for parties. So we've got male respondents who are much more likely to support the far-right confederation. So this appeal to the nationalistic messages, also a certain free market logic and wide-ranging tax cuts that confederation advocates for is appealing to men. Whereas women are much more likely to support the far left, which in our data scores roughly 9%. So here, the left wing, Levitsa, is developing a program around the legislation of abortion, also far-reaching social programs, and that's visibly much more appealing to female voters, unlike the nationalistic messages that we see from Confederation, which appeals to male voters. Yeah, that's uh, indeed surprising, some of these uh, voting attentions also, if you compare that maybe to other countries. Jakob, what is your surprise of the survey, so to say? Well, um, my first highlight um, is well linked to Felix's explanation of the voting um, intention. So let me continue. The question we asked was, is there a political party in Poland that expresses your interest? Respondents were provided with four response options, spanning from definitely no to definitely yes. Young Poles find it challenging to identify a political party that truly aligns with their interests. This highlights both the promise and the hurdles of engaging the youth in the political arena. However, young Poles expressing their intent to vote for Confederation demonstrate the strongest belief that a specific political party resonates with their interests, underscoring the potential stability in their voting choices should they participate in the elections. Roughly 34% of young voters have found political parties that align with their interests, indicating successful appeal to young Poles' concerns and values. Among those who intend to vote for Confederation, PO and Peace, young Poles tend to respond rather positively to the question about party alignment. With a somewhat positive party alignment, young Poles express an intention to vote for their preferred party with each of the three parties receive votes. And conversely, The 45% who feel unrepresented by any political party reveal a substantial gap in the political landscape. Furthermore, young Poles lean towards voting intentions aligned with PO, Confederation and other small parties when they encounter difficulties to or refuse to answer questions about the party alignment. This tendency highlights a degree of uncertainty and hesitancy among a portion of young voters, which one in five respondents falling into this category. This is the first highlight for me. Okay, so these examples that you've just given, they all relate to political preference. 
preference and party alignment of just the young Poles. What I would also be interested in is to see whether there's a difference between the generations. So I know your focus was on the youth, but did you also measure that somehow? Yes, we did. Uh, and in our survey, we thought to explore the perceptions of young Poles regarding the alignment of political parties with their parents' I interests to have a bit of intergenerational dimension in the survey. We asked respondents whether they believed there was a political party in Poland that expressed their parents' interests. And to delve deeper into that, we inquired separately about the alignments of their father's and mother's interests with political parties. And an intriguing observation here is the transparency of respondents regarding their parents' political interests. It's evident that respondents express greater confidence in the existence of political party representing their father's interests. However, it is not worthy that a significant percentage also perceived alignment with their mother's interests, albeit slightly lower than for their father's. Uh, subsequently, we aim to understand whether the political program of the party representing their parents' interest was in line with their own political view, just to continue the intergenerational dimension here. This question allowed us to gain insights into the interplay between generational perspectives and political affiliation among the younger demographic in Poland. A total of 40% of respondents appear to perceive a no alignment between their political beliefs and the party rep representing their parents' interests. This indicates that a notable portion of young individuals may differ from their parents in terms of political ideology. Conversely, 34% believe there is some level of alignment between their own political beliefs and their parents' party, and about 25.7% of the respondents indicated don't know refuse to answer the question, signifying uncertainty or hesitation in making a clear judgment regarding the alignment of their political beliefs with their parents' party. While a significant portion perceives alignment, a notable percentage also indicates either divergence or uncertainty in their political views within this demographic. This complexity highlights the dynamic nature of political ideologies within families and the evolving landscape of political engagement among young Poles. So this is another highlight for me. Thanks, Jakob. Felix, uh, you mentioned as one of your highlights the voting intentions and the political preference of, of young Poles. Is there anything else apart from these political preferences that came up striking in the survey? Yeah, maybe one thing um, that we should mention, and I would change gear now thematically a bit um, and return to the early discussion on the relevance of the war in Ukraine for Polish society. And Jakob already mentioned that we've got a battery of questions on that. And I think the responses here are quite remarkable. I mean, as probably all of our listeners know, there was a huge degree of mobilization from within Polish society for the Ukrainians that arrived after February 2022. And we can see that also in our data. So it's just above one quarter of respondents who said they were not involved in any kind of activities to support Ukrainians. Um, so three quarters of young Poles did something. And they did things such as donating items, um, including prams or clothing or food. That was done by a third of our respondents. And a quarter of respondents indicated that they either donated money for Ukrainians in Poland or for people in Ukraine itself. So this impression that we had of a wide-ranging mobilization of Polish society is also confirmed in our data. What is maybe interesting is that those who were not involved were overwhelmingly men, respondents with lower levels of education, and those who indicate that they were Catholic. If we go one step further, though, um, bit of mobilization for the Ukrainians in Poland, but what is the place of these Ukrainians in Polish society? And I think that's an, an interesting nuance here because the data also show how little integrated the Ukrainians are in Polish society. So we've got a question in there, how often do they interact with Ukrainian friends or acquaintances? And it's more than 70% of our respondents who state that they don't have any Ukrainian acquaintances or friends or that they never interact with them. So Ukrainians... Yes, they were supported and it's accepted that they are part of the Polish social landscape. But in terms of social integration, there remains a significant gap between the Polish society that we've surveyed and the Ukrainians who are now part of Poland. Thanks. Um, okay, so a lot of information gathered in just this uh, one survey. I think what you've presented has made very clear that this is indeed going to be a very interesting election, one that we should really pay attention to. Just quickly, one sentence each, if you can manage. What should we pay attention to when we follow the news in the coming week? 
I would say watch out for those who are not yet decided whom they would want to vote for. Um, there's a survey that was released in late September from CBOS, and they found that a quarter of the Polish electorate is not yet decided on whom they would want to vote for. So that's a huge part of the electorate. And I think whoever is able to mobilize those who are not yet decided will win this election. And that probably means that the political discourse will become even more polarized um, and polemical. And then from 15th of October onwards, I think these coalition negotiations will be extremely difficult. And depending on the outcome, it will be a reason for concern or just a fascination to watch how this will unfold. But whatever the result of the coalition negotiations after the election, I think that will be crucial for the position that Poland has within the European Union and therefore the EU's capacity to act in a coherent manner when it comes to the war in Ukraine. And of course, it also has very profound domestic political implications for Poland. Okay, that was a very long one sentence. Um, Hakob? I'll have a very short one. I think uh, I'll be watching confederation and how it, it is playing in the election because I think the outcome of this election will be heavily linked to the outcome of, uh, you know, what kind of votes they receive. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was shorter. So thanks to Jakob and Felix for sharing their insights um, and to the evolving viewpoints of Poland's youth. I think the findings of their survey has given us or at least me, a better understanding of what is at stake in the elections and what position the youth has in this. To our listeners, we encourage you to reflect, discuss, and engage with our research. So you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and also on our project website, where we regularly share our research results and other interesting food for thought. We will also be back in the podcast later this year with uh, more information on our focus group discussions and some insights from our journey to Estonia. So until then, stay curious and informed. David Zenia. Thank you so much, Johanna. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.